if we're unbiased in our reading, it seems all but certain. Abram was an idol worshipping heathen. The Lord had spoken to Abram and told him to get out of your country, get away from your people, those of your extended family, leave your place in the community and travel to a far distant land. Due to Abram's obedience, he will become a prominent figure of scripture. His name is mentioned approximately 300 times in the Bible. Abram would be the central man of a great new nation, Thomas 1. God would bless Abram, Thomas 2. Abram's name would be great, Thomas 3. God promises that Abram will be a blessing to others, Thomas 4. From that point forward, God was locked into blessing those who blessed Abram, Thomas 5, and cursing those who cursed Abram, Thomas 6. And the seventh promise God makes to Abram is a disguised promise that Messiah would come from Abram's lineage. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. God had always wanted to give Abram and Sarah a son of promise. But due to Abram's delayed obedience, they had to wait many years for their son of promise. It turns out Sarah was also the half-sister of Abram. Abram partially obeys God. He leaves Ur, but he takes his father with him and Lot. God reveals an eighth promise to add to the verses two and three, first seven promises. The broader framework of the Abrahamic covenant has been laid out in the first seven verses of chapter 12. It's at this point, for the first time, we hear that Abram called on the name of the Lord. Then God sent a famine throughout Canaan. He moves down to Egypt. Abram's fear was the Egyptians wouldn't commit adultery, but they'd happily kill a man to take his beautiful wife. Abram's lies separate him from his wife, then plague the house of Pharaoh. Pharaoh commands removal from his house and from his lands without delay, all things connected with Abram. Get him out! He doesn't even want the gifts showered upon Abram to be returned. Genesis 13 will help you locate the general location we should expect to find the city of Sodom on the eastern edge of the floodplain of the Jordan River. Abram went up geographically, spiritually and ethically. Moses is meticulous in detailing that Lot was with Abram. Abram pitched his tent at the house of God. When you're living near the house of God, it's easy to call on the name of the Lord and live in his light and truth. In effect, by blessing both men, God organizes the circumstances such that Abram is forced into obeying God's original instructions to depart from his father's household. Lot makes a decision that will see him descend both literally and spiritually to the lowest place on earth. And Tel El Hamar is almost certainly the true location of biblical Sodom. Lot saw with his eyes, then he chose for himself. No hint that he consulted God. You finally obeyed me, Abram. Now surely this land of the Canaanites is yours and your descendants forever. A generation of Jews can be judged and exiled from the land, but future generations are still the inheritors of God's eternal promise. We now turn to Genesis 14. So we have a northern Mesopotamian invasion of the southern Canaanite and Amorite lands. The northern kings, in short order, suppress the entire southern rebellion. Lot is taken captive. Then, into the storyline, strides Abram once more. The wealth of Abram is clearly demonstrated by the size of his personal army. 318 trained servants, born in his own house. What better place for these southern men of power to meet and negotiate after Abram's victory over the northern army? Whoever enigmatic Melchizedek was, we know from Hebrews 7, he was like the Son of God. He was a priest of the Most High God. Blessed be Abram of God Most High. After God was given credit for the war victory, after Abram consumed the bread and wine, after Abram was blessed by the priest of El Elyon, Abram gives the king one-tenth of all his war plunder. This was an act of worship to God. 
Abram was acknowledging his victory was God's victory. And by giving this tithe, Abram is prophetically acknowledging the Levitical priesthood to come through his descendants is lesser than the priesthood to come from Messiah, whose priesthood is according to the order of Melchizedek. Satan will offer you the goods of the world in exchange for your soul. After showing such respect for Melchizedek, Abram now shows total disdain for this son of evil, this king of wickedness. Almost certainly Lot would have been listening into this conversation. Surely now, he must have started to regret his earlier life choices to tolerate and live in the company of such an evil. God rewards his loyal servants. In fact, God was Abram's reward. Abram uses a new title for God here, Adonai. Abram had no child. It was considered a disgrace in this culture to have no children. Now Lot had left him, and a servant, Eliezer, stood to inherit everything Abram had built up. The countless stars, the sand of the sea, the hairs of your head. A lifetime of counting, and you won't have come close to finishing the count. Billions of descendants from Abram. This is the first time the word believed is used in scripture. We're not saved by making promises of doing good, we're saved by believing God's promises. In Galatians 3, Paul wrote, Just as Abram believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Abram didn't follow the law given at Sinai, he lived centuries before Moses. Abram wasn't a Jew, he wasn't an Israelite, Abram wasn't even circumcised, and yet God credits righteousness to him apart from the law, apart from circumcision. Abram prepares the contract. The contract involved the slaying of five animals. Typically, once the slaughtered animals were laid upon the ground, the two signatories walked together between the slain animals. Your descendants will be strangers and afflicted in a foreign land for 400 years. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now we come to the signing of the contract of blood. Well after the sun had set, when it was completely dark, the judging, light-emitting God, in the form of a smoking oven and a burning torch, passed through the dead animals on his own. God didn't walk through with Abram, as was customary. This solo signing, prefiguring to all, the work of redemption was solely and singularly the domain of God. We offer nothing in any contract with God. Abram was promised a land, a son, special blessings, but most significantly, he was told the son of promise, the seed of the woman, would come from his line. And Christ, Abram's promised seed, would ultimately willingly go to the place of the skull, pay the full terrible price of the redemption of mankind. He would do this alone. The full extent of the land inheritance is quite an impressive territory. The northern extent is the Euphrates River in northern Syria. The southern boundary is the river of Egypt. Sarah made a decision which rippled through the pages of human history. And let's not let Abram off the hook. There's not the slightest hint Hagar had any say to decline the offer. We'd rightfully call this rape. And the chickens came home to roost. Abram's sin had found him out. Poor Hagar bears the brunt of Abram's unfaithfulness. Hagar is a great example to all of us. Without hesitation, simply fall into line with his will. Ishmael means hell or God is. The father of the Arabs was Ishmael, a wild, unstable, warring, donkey-like man. And the founding prophet of the Muslims, Mohammed, a lying, raping, mass-murdering, pedophilic, narcissistic con man. Little wonder the Mideast is in such a mess. We learn from Hagar, even if you've been used, abused, forgotten and overlooked, the God of grace has a plan and purpose for your life. Abraham is given the sign of this eternal covenant. Jews still to this day practice circumcision, the singular sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Curse them and God will curse you. Bless them and God will bless you. Your church leaders have likely lied to you about Israel your entire Christian life. A word play is evident. No cut and you're cut off. True circumcision is circumcision made without hands. Abraham laughs openly. Sarah laughs privately. Isaac means one who laughs. God can see our heart. 
something wonderful has been taught in both the New and Old Testament about Isaac being the only begotten, unique son. God had bigger and better plans that Abram couldn't envisage, plans involving the salvation of mankind. Isaac and his descendants will inherit the Abrahamic promises of a God, blessings and curses, promised land and a coming Messiah. We need to learn to be patient and wait upon the Lord. In this verse, God declares for the first time in the Bible, his name is El Shaddai. Are we walking in the flesh, symbolized by Ishmael? Or are we walking in the promises of God, symbolized by Isaac? The God of the Bible is a promise-keeping God. No longer would he be called Exalted Father, but Father of many nations. What El Shaddai wills and promises, he always delivers on. This is an everlasting covenant to both Abraham and the nation of Israel. God doesn't weasel out of promises like the replacement theologists. And yes, it's very true, Israel have been incredibly unfaithful to God over the years. But in a future day, Israel will acknowledge their guilt of rejecting Jesus and call on him to return and save them. And in the millennium, El Shaddai will truly be Israel's God. Two were angels, and one was Jesus. Abraham more or less begs them to stay for lunch. Learn from the gracious hospitality of Abraham, the godly bow in humble deference. Notice, Abraham, not Sarah, is blamed and questioned about Sarah's laughter. Sarah's laughter was another mark of failure in Abraham's life. If a husband and father fails to lead his family into godly Christ-centered living, he's failed in his primary duty and responsibility. The wrath of God wouldn't be poured out on Sodom for 10 righteous, but what about one? If you're happy in the pig pen of sin, you're not a child of God. Lot is one of numerous examples in the Bible, prefiguring a pre-tribulation rapture. In the last days, just as in Lot's day, judgment will fall upon the earth dwellers after the rapture. In journeying to Sodom, we descend to the lowest place on earth. Every time I read this chapter, I wonder why God didn't wipe out the city with Lot in it. If you think you can cohabit with evil and not be consumed by it, you're dreaming. Absolute madness driven by demonic evil, like in ancient Sodom. Lot's godly witness is totally destroyed. God's metaphoric finger is hovering over the button of obliteration. It's sayonara Sodom, goodbye Gomorrah, and farewell floodplain families. Escape for your life. Run from Sodomite cities and churches. Don't look back and don't settle for small places of iniquity. There's something about a second glance that leads us capitulating to the pool of what we left behind. She represents for us hollowed out, compromised, liberal, fake Christianity whose end is multi-flavored destruction. The sorry story of Lot's life is a warning tale to Christians. Abraham has journeyed far and wide from worshiping the moon god to worshiping the creator of the moon. How hot must Sarah have been? God sends a bim like a dream. The dream revealed his entire kingdom would be destroyed for taking Abraham's wife. Satan has Sarah in another king's hair. The demonic always tries to thwart the plans of God. God actively stopped Abimelech from touching Sarah. I believe this was a day of mighty heavenly warfare. Abimelech's an unwitting pawn in this larger demonic plan of treachery. Stand firmly on the word. Stand securely on the rock of our salvation. Stand sure in Christ. One little white lie came within a millimeter of the death of thousands. Abraham is not only the father of many nations. He's the father of finger pointers. It's Abimelech's fault. It's God's fault. It's Sarah's fault. Everyone but me. The goal of Abraham to take this bounty as reward for his deception. Your eyes are too beautiful for men to look upon. The Lord intervened supernaturally in the conception of the Son of Promise. There was a particular heavenly appointed time for the arrival. The name of the prophesied son was proclaimed prior to his birth. His mother was incredulous at news of the impossible conception. Much in the Old Testament declares the coming of the mighty God-man. How Abraham's heart swelled with love. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Beautiful emotions erupting in laughter, no longer born from derision and disbelief. Get that de facto child out of my house. I no longer need a substitute heir. I have the genuine article. Once the promise arrived, 
there was no place for law. For in Christ, we are sons of promise. Isaac is the son of promise. The life of Hagar instructs, God hears the cry of the innocent, desperate, wronged. God will ask Abraham to do what seems unbearable and unreasonable, and by faith, expect what seems impossible. Oh, how the Bible haters love to take this passage and make God out to be a terrible ogre. Go to a certain hilltop in the region of Moriah, a very specific mountain, and in that high place, kill Isaac, your son of promise. Abraham could easily have said at this point, enough God, I'm done with following your way. I won't do it. Abraham doesn't hesitate. He rises early the next morning and sets off to immediately obey God. So Abraham knows either God will intervene to stop the sacrifice, or God would have to raise his only son from the dead. These events were foreshadowing a greater future event, and the prophetic symbolism acted out would have been ruined by the inclusion of the donkey and servants. These are powerful prophetic words from Abraham's lips. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. The two of them went together to God's particular chosen, holy destination. The son at this point clearly a willing participant. He's really about to kill his own son. God sets up this binding of Isaac to prefigure the coming greatest sacrifice in human history. God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice his son. He always planned for the ram substitute for Isaac. God has a plan of escape for humanity. As Isaac carried the heavy burden of the wood upon his back, so did Jesus carry his heavy wooden cross. Jehovah Jireh provided a substitute in place of Isaac, but there was no substitute for Jesus. God did indeed provide for himself the lamb. Abraham's absolute obedience enables the perfect foreshadowing of Christ. 